Hello, so in this video, um, it's just a bit of a pet peeve of mine, um, but we're actually going to go into detail about it. Um, there's a there's a YouTube video called History in Bits, um, and they talk about uh, how well is the Byzantine Empire portrayed in uh, Crusader Kings 3. I'm going to deconstruct this video or dissect it, and basically, um, I think a lot of the stuff is kind of misphrased, and it's a bit of a pet peeve. Uh, on my part so we're just going to get into it I'm going to correct this video as it goes along and talk about the Byzantine Empire or simply the Eastern Roman Empire will be known as the uh, Empire or Kingdom of the Romans or simply Roman land or Romania or more accurately Romania um, so yes that, that's really the basis of it but we're going to talk about this video now determined by the vote taken on our community feed this video will cover the mighty Byzantine Empire, the eastern continuation of the Roman Empire with its capital of Constantinople. Alright, so he's... the person who's saying this has said that accurate... that statement basically accurate... accurately. Um, the, the east... the Byzantine Empire wasn't called the Byzantine Empire at the time. It was called the Eastern Roman Empire, or simply Roman land, or the Kingdom or Empire of the Romans. It was a eastern continuation of the Roman Empire that survived when the West fell. It was actually doing quite well when the Western uh, Roman Empire dissolved. So all well and good. It survived a thousand years um, until it ended in 1453 uh, with the siege of Constantinople by the Ottoman uh, dynasty under Mehmet the Conqueror. Um, there were successor states as well, like the Empire of Trezeb Trebizond, which survived. There was also a Roman um, outpost in the south of the um, Crimean Peninsula as well. Uh, there was also Epirus, uh, I think the Duchy of Athens as well. All of these places ha were ruled by uh, Romans. So they were all Roman land. Um, and it, it's important to emphasize as well as, uh, you know, based on Anthony Caldellis's work, um, especially Roman Land, which I highly recommend, uh, after Caracalla gives universal citizenship to all Romans, all people within the Roman Empire, um, we begin this shift and it really transitions into what we would consider a nation state rather than a empire because it's only ruling over roman citizens because empires are really predicated on one group being superior to all other groups but that seems to disappear after uh Caracalla's universal citizenship and that actually continues uh well until the the siege of constantinople so there's actually a very strong case that you know the the interpretation of what nation states are firstly isn't really that modern um, and it has existed prior and uh, secondly um, that because it's pre-existing it's also bound by the same framework as well I'll go into more detail about this and we'll continue as we will discuss in this video the Byzantines really did not see themselves as the Byzantines but rather simply as the Romans while the Pope so it's important to see here that it's not the case that the Byzantines saw themselves as Romans. That's one particular facet of the conversation. They were Romans. They called themselves Romans. Um, they knew that their ethnicity was Roman. Uh, it wasn't just a civic identity, um, but their ethnicity could be linked to both uh, Orthodox Christianity and uh, so Chalcedonian Christianity and also the polity. So, as the Greeks would say, Bolidia, or as the Latins would say, Respublica. And uh, this was their de determining point. It's not a matter of perception. If if 100,000 people perceive themselves uh, genuinely as, or sincerely as Romans, they are Romans, because they have a community which, though it is a construction, it is a one which is validated and, whether imagined or real, is sustained through traditions, through uh, various myths, uh, through past events, through common um, events which bind that community together. 
Um, so yes, the it's not really a case that the Roman em- the Eastern Romans perceived themselves as Roman. In de facto, they were Romans. As religious head had remained in the old capital of Rome, the political power of the empire had gradually shifted towards Constantinople in the last centuries of classical antiquity. So this is actually not accurate. Um, so um, during the civil wars, kind of, uh, you know, crisis of the third century, we actually get a shifting of the Roman Empire, the capital city going where the emperor is. The emperor is a physical embodiment of the polity of the state. And because of that, he's all, the authority of the state goes wherever he goes. Rome stays as kind of a very important city, but it doesn't stay as a capital city. This is kind of one of the things that people don't understand when they talk about Eastern Roman or Byzantine history, because they often make the argument that um, the Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. Rome, as a concept, became the empire it ruled. It was the landmass that was the Roman Empire, became Rome itself. Rome was where Romans were. Rome was where the emperor was or in the Byzantine case where the king was, um, because uh, Vasilia, uh, really the literal definition of Vasilia means uh, king and sovereign, but it, it's not equitable, it's not an equivalent term to emperor. Now with Constantine, you begin getting the shift to Constantinople as a main capital city, uh, in which case um, you kind of get the set for the division between East and West, but that division had already been existing, for example, with the crisis of the third century. The East had always been the place where the money flowed compared to the West, and that was a major problem for the Western Roman Empire, is trying to pay its soldiers and trying to get uh, tax revenue as well. So this is sort of half right, but the in the Roman Empire, you know, Rome... Um, kind of was this very important city it was home to the senate but its importance kind of diminished um and also you know it could actually be a detriment because it's a massive basket case of people who you need to pay on the bread dole and you need to host games for um let's continue so it was logical for the rulers in constantinople to see themselves as the continuation of the roman emperors so again it's not a question of the rulers seeing themselves as a continue of the continuation of the Roman Empire, Roman emperors. They were Roman emperors. Uh, they used the legal framework of the Roman Empire. They considered themselves ethnically Roman. They spoke Romaic, which is a term that comes up in the medieval period. But and as a as a point about languages, because people often bring up um, the fact that uh, the Eastern Roman Empire spoke Greek, um, and and it's often used as a kind of a criticism of the the Byzantine Empire that uh, Latin was the main language of the Roman Empire and therefore the Byzantine Empire isn't Roman. That's actually not true. Uh, the Roman Empire referred, even in its heyday, with Latin and Greek as quote-unquote our two languages. Um, gradually, as what we consider today Greek, began to take over they referred to latin as our ancestral language and eventually the term greek disappears altogether and the term uh, of what we know now as greek gets called a romaic romiga or romaica um, and this is something that continues well into the 19th century um, so it happens for a very long time um, and we actually have lexicons I think from the early modern period that have Greek referring to ancient Greek, uh, Romaic referring to modern Greek, and then we have the um, uh, Russian as well. So this idea kind of that the Eastern Roman Empire couldn't be uh, Roman because it was Greek speaking, that had never really been a, a thing. There was no official language of the Roman Empire. There was an administrative language, but it was both Latin and Greek. Uh, both were equally regarded. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, et tu Brutus was actually said in Greek, not Latin. Uh, Greek was uh, seen as a, a thing that could have uh, uh, access to a very um, o 
a, a higher form of education because philosophers were stereotypically seen as Greek, um, which had positive and negative stereotypes as well. And so this kind of uh, point about, um, you know, the, the Byzantine Empire being Greek speaking, it's a lot like saying um, the Byzantine Empire was a Hellenic culture, but it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a non sequitur term because, you know, by definition, the Roman Empire in itself was Hellenic in culture. It incorporated a lot of Hellenicism uh, in its structure, in its culture and in, in its institutions as well. And um, by the time the quote unquote Byzantine Empire existed, all that Hellenic culture had converted into a Roman culture that was very distinct, that was intertwined with Orthodox Christianity, as it would become known, and also with a political system that was linked to a polity of the state, um, very much a res publica kind of uh, deal. However, in the High Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire increasingly struggled to stand their ground against the Muslims in the East and Catholic Europe in the West. So this is actually a half-truth. I don't think it's really true at all. Um, it depends what part of the High Middle Ages you're talking about. There's often this narrative that the Byzantine Empire went into a was in constantly in a state of slow decline. That's not necessarily true. An empire that lasts a thousand years isn't in a slow decline if it outlasts other empires, whether it be the Abbasids, the Sassanids, the Fatimids, um, the, the Seljuks, you know, whatever you want to, the Sultanate of Rum, uh, you know, uh, or the Normans, like, um, even in, uh, even in kind of when the nice, the Empire of Nicaea gets back Constantinople, there is still this prospect that the empire will somewhat survive and continue on from my understanding anyway i could be wrong that being said the main perception when it comes to uh eastern roman perspectives is one of actual decline anyway so it's but that's a that's a lit, that's a perceptive sort of thing in the way that we might see that things are going to hell now kind of with climate change and that we might have a very pessimistic view in terms of decline of the earth or stuff that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a accurate term to make um because what can objectively be the case i.e the increase in technology the higher standards of living the the less global hunger in the world compared to what it was 20 years ago can all be things which are measured to show that actually things are getting better. So even with the kind of Byzantine perspective, the perspective of decline, that doesn't necessarily um, contribute to an actual de facto perception. And once again, an empire that lasts a thousand years um, isn't really one that's in decline. Things become effective until they stop becoming effective. Um, let's continue. So the empire is in a difficult yet fascinating position in Crusader Kings' 1066 start. So at 1066, the Eastern Roman Empire is at its height that, for the first time in a very long time. And it's, uh, it's through the policies of people like uh, uh, John Zimiskis and uh, Basil II. And uh, you have this large uh, landmass now you have a very standardized bureaucracy you have a very large army it, it's difficult to see at in 1066 that the eastern roman empire is going to experience what it's going to experience because hindsight is 2020 and it's uh it's easy for us to look at the the um catastrophe of manzica and Dyrrhachium and the the civil wars and what Alexius Komnenos has to go through but at the time of the zenith of the Byzantine Empire which is taking place in 1066 it, it's if you lived at the time you wouldn't be able to predict the future and you wouldn't have that benefit of hindsight that we do. Considering that, it is a tad disappointing that there are unfortunately some issues with the game's portrayal of the historic Eastern Roman Empire. Paradox has already hinted at a Byzantine expansion, as seen in the screenshot promising not a flavour pack, 
but a full expansion. So in this video we want to give our assessment of how well the Byzantine Empire is portrayed in CK3 from a historical perspective. Perhaps some of the flaws we have detected about the Empire's portrayal will be fixed in the course of a future expansion. If you like our content, you might want to consider liking and subscribing to our channel. And if you want to enable us to reduce our real okay, I'm just going to forward it to get through the explanation. Life job. CK3, you'd like to see covered. Your suggestions on what we should cover. Antine Church, you could recommend. When you select the Byzantine Empire, which covers almost the entirety of the Balkans and Asia Minor in Crusader Kings' 1066 start, Emperor Basilius Constantinos X comes up. The term Basilius is a Greek term, most commonly translated as monarch, ambiguously referring to either kings or emperors. So the once again the the literal term of uh, Vasilio, Vasilev or Vasilia is or Vasilis is I think I've got the phrase incorrectly is monarch but more accurately king. Um, there isn't in in Greek there isn't really an equivalent word for uh, emperor. So you can based on what the president of what an emperor might be. Um, based on that proposition, you can use the term emperor, but on a literal and technical uh, discourse, you can't really apply it. And this is historically accurate that they would call themselves this. More precisely, they referred to themselves as Basilius Romion. So, uh, Basilius du Romaon, um, maybe this term is correct, Basilius Romeon uh, or Romaion. That basically means a uh, Roman king or like a uh, kingdom of the Romans. Um, but it, it, in a lot of ways, if we go by um, pre early modern republicanism, a Roman king is a republican king um, because he's chosen or he's elected, even though election wouldn't mean the same thing we do. If a conspire, if a group of conspir conspirators choose a person to be a pretender to the throne and he becomes king he is elected by those people that is the terminology which is used so it, it kind of varies and it's a massive contradiction but um we see this with the byzantine kings that there is no six succession framework on how a, a, a byzantine emperor is chosen it, the fact that a person is born in purple might be used as rhetoric to legitimize them somewhat, but it doesn't actually legitimize them if they're a terrible ruler or something. It's sort of like the mandate of heaven for China, if that makes sense. There, There's this uh, precipice that anyone can be emperor of the Romans, and that carries um, certain opportunistic uh, opportunities but at the same time there are a lot of liabilities and it's no coincidence that the Eastern Roman Empire is revered uh, or infamous for the amount of civil wars it has. In an effort to emphasize their own legitimacy as the real Roman Empire. So it's not even a matter of legitimacy to the Roman Empire, it's a statement of fact to these people. These people are Romans they govern a polity which is Roman, which inherited the Roman institutions of old, which changed through time. They inherited uh, customs and uh, religious customs as well that um, are distinctly Roman, and they're distinctly Roman because they're separate to other things, whether it be the Latin West or uh, the Islamic North Africa and the Islamic uh, Middle East or you know the the Rus in the north or the Pechenegs or the Cumans or uh, the Lombards there, there is this distinct national identity or nation state that nobody at the time you know prior to Charlemagne would have had any issues calling these people Roman it's only when Charlemagne decides to be crowned by the Pope as Emperor of the Romans that there begins to kind of be this delegitimization. The Romans get called the Empire of the Greeks. Um, at their most respectable, they were called the Empire of New Rome. 
Um, and this continues well on to the 19th century, where due to the kind of uh, fear, Russophobia, um, and this idea that Greece would be this rump state, according to Anthony Cardellus, this Russian rump state, they created this term Byzantine, which had been coined uh, by a German historian, but didn't actually, the, the term itself didn't take hold in till the, or he was a German scholar in the 16th century, but the definition, the word itself doesn't take hold until the 19th century. You see, as we have covered in previous videos, after the Frankish ruler Charlemagne had become monarch of several important European kingdoms in the 8th century, in the year 800 he was proclaimed Roman Emperor by the Pope which damaged diplomatic relations between the Franks and the Byzantines. This was resolved in 812 by the Byzantines agreeing to call the Frankish ruler Basilius, but putting additional emphasis on themselves as the Roman emperors. So this is this is half true. So the agreement was that the the Charlemagne essentially could use the title of emperor or king, but he couldn't use, he could use it as like emperor of the Franks but he couldn't use it as emperor of the romans because he didn't govern any romans he didn't have any legitimacy uh, in calling himself roman the fact that he was crowned by the pope in rome uh, didn't legitimize him as roman he wasn't ethnically roman he um he didn't he didn't really uh, abide by any criteria that would legitimate legitimize him before people talk about the position of the Pope, um, the Pope in the uh, Roman Empire, when he was the Archbishop of Rome, um, had some authority, but he didn't have authority over the state, and he certainly didn't have authority to uh, crown people as Roman emperors. This is something that comes up at the time of Charlemagne and is very much used as uh papal i don't know what the other t what a uh, better term would be other than propaganda uh to support this kind of viewpoint that the pope um during the time of the western roman empire certainly wouldn't i don't believe would have had that authority to do so so you kind of have this uh twisting of this narrative um you have the uh, empire of charlemagne basically that became the holy roman empire later on through um as time went on uh claiming that they are the legitimate successors of the roman empire and by doing that they have to delegitimize the actual uh roman land that existed in the east and this comes from a guy called anastasius the librarian he begins creating what we consider to be a lot of the points that are made that the byzantine empire isn't roman that their capital isn't Rome, even though the capital had for a very long time not been Rome, that they didn't speak uh, Latin, they spoke Greek, and therefore they were Greek. Well, the Romans called it Romaic, um, or, yeah, Romaic, and um, language hasn't been a requirement, um, that, sorry, there hadn't been any language requirement in terms of being a Roman citizen either, um, so you didn't necessarily have to speak um, Greek or Latin to be a Roman. It would probably be a lingua franca that you would learn, you know, to get by or if you were traveling to other parts of the empire. Um, but for example, we have soldiers writings from their time in Britain where they were writing in Greek. So it's very well known that Greek was very much a lingua franca of the Roman Empire. And also, this doesn't seem to be an issue with uh, any of the Islamic empires who called um, the Byzantine Empire Bilad al-Rum, land of the Romans, or I think it's uh, Rumnya, which means Roman land, essentially. So this, I um, and they also argued that the Eastern Romans couldn't be Greeks because they weren't pagans, because the ancient Greeks uh, worshipped the... Uh, they worship the Olympic gods. And so it, so even from, if you if you kind of look at Muslim or Islamic historiography and the way that they conceptualize it, they consider these people Roman. When the Ottomans conquer the Eastern Roman Empire, the remnants of it, uh, they call the Greek-speaking Orthodox dominion, uh, certainly later on, Ram Milet. 
or more accurately uh, Rum Imiled, which means the Roman nation or the Roman people. So this has never really been an issue in the Middle East. Um, and it's actually quite confusing for people who are well versed in kind of um, Islamic or Middle Eastern history. Um, and he, I believe the Quran actually refers to the Byzantine Empire as Rum, which means Rome. So when uh, Mehmet the Conqueror conquered uh, Constantinople, in his eyes, he was conquering Rome. Um, so yeah, it's just quite interesting to see that. Let's continue. By using the term Basilius Romeon. So we can clearly see that the Byzantine Empire saw themselves as the direct descendants of the Roman emperors. The descendant implies that there is a disconnect uh, to the um, main father, that it's essentially an offspring. But the, the Eastern Romans wouldn't have perceived themselves as descendants. Uh, is, is, they, would dis, they would perceive themselves as descendants in the same way that somebody in 300 AD would perceive themselves as descendants of the Romans of 100 AD. But even the Romans who didn't weren't originally Roman knew or had some idea that their ancestors weren't originally Roman and went through what was called Romeo Genesis, where they would assimilate into the culture and become Roman. But um, it's not a matter of these people being descendants of Romans. They, they were Romans. Um, they're not some sort of offshoot that's delegitimized. They're a surviving uh, polity and nation state that is Roman. So it's not a matter of being a descendant. I'm a descendant of a Greek Cypriot ancestry. But that doesn't make my perception of myself because of the fact that I was raised in a Greek Cypriot family any less Greek Cypriot than maybe my my ancestors 300 years ago. And the same goes for if you're English and you've had an English line going back 500 years to the time of Shakespeare or something. Uh, it's not it's not a matter of being a descendant or something because that can be used as a term to take away from what Roman Romania was, which was essentially uh, the Roman Empire or the Roman state or the Roman kingdom. Even calling their empire the Roman Empire. They called it the Roman Empire or more accurately Roman land because it was a land consisting of Romans. And it was not just the rulers who were convinced of this. They're not convinced. They're not convinced they're Roman. They are Roman. This isn't some sort of closeted identity where secretly they're something else, and then they end up. Um, they're they're only superficially Roman. These people consider themselves Roman because they're Roman. If if a person from the UK is British or English, and they've been English. They've had a family which is English for a thousand years. They don't consider themselves Celts uh, because, you know, they're, once upon a time their family was genealogy-wise uh, part of the uh, Celtic tribes which were fighting the Romans. They're, they're English because that's what they consider themselves because ethnicities are constructions. They're, they can change. They're tangible. But that doesn't mean that the, the, everything is relative. If a community believes that they are Roman sincerely and they have the, the myths and the narratives and the communal experience in the same way that, you know, Jewish communities have existed since, you know, uh, antiquity, but still consider themselves Jewish, they don't consider themselves Jewish. They are Jewish. It's 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 not necessarily a perception. It's a fact of life. Um, so what this person's saying is um, is not correct at all. Uh, the pe the people who lived in this polity or state and the rulers weren't closeted Greeks. weren't closeted Ro uh, Greeks who thought that they were Romans. Um, they they were Roman. They called themselves Roman. They spoke Romaic. Um, they it were invested in a polity which was Roman that had survived and continued in the East. Even the citizens of the empire referred to their state as the Roman Empire and to themselves as Romans. Yes, there we go. 
but th even then the the roman empire in the east wasn't really much of an empire um source material and also research by anthony caldellis shows that there's this perception that the romans live within what we would consider today a nation state which is and when the empire begin when the sorry i'm even getting into this when the state begins expanding on the zimiskis basil ii um they have certain theoretically everyone within the empire within the state i mean i'm even saying it now um is roman but they have somewhat distinctive uh, legal structures for the bulgars and also for armenians and for assyrians etc um so christian arabs as well um so th there's this there's this kind of perception that the, the empire at that time is or the the nation state at that time is a nation state with somewhat imperial aspects as well um so it's not really an empire um it's an empire in a very literal sense but it, it is a nation state and it, it's probably one of the main deciding factors for why the uh, Eastern Roman state doesn't expand to get the old borders that it had. Because what is it going to do? Most of the inhabitants there are now Muslims or consider themselves Arabs. Um, so this gradual shrinking of this state um, essentially boils down to the fact that there aren't Romans in those places anymore. Or if they are, they're in a very small minority. And, you know, from Anthony Caldellis's podcast, Byzantium and Fres, there's kind of this perception that uh, one, one of the Eastern Roman kings is uh, a vassal of the um, Ottomans. He's going through all these ru ruins and he's seeing kind of this world that used to exist, which no longer is. And it must have been a bit of a crisis for him to think that. This was despite the fact that they were not actually speaking Latin and were culturally quite different to ancient Rome. This is a non sec this is nonsensical um, and it doesn't make any sense. So the the again, language wasn't a requirement in the Roman Empire and um, Greek was actually uh, a lingua franca of the Roman Empire um, as much as Latin was and it was referred to as our two languages. Later, Latin became referred to as our ancestral language um, and Greek, uh, you know, the inhabitants who called themselves Greek stopped calling themselves Greek by the first century or second century BC. They considered themselves Romans thereafter. It isn't a case that these people were closeted Greeks for like a thousand years and then 1826 hit and then they were suddenly Greeks again. Even uh then there were greek people calling themselves romans the the term for cypriot greeks is romios or romyi which is still a term that's legitimate and used today greek speaking muslims in turkey are considered um rumiga uh, any surviving christians uh, who are greek speaking in turkey are called ram this stuff is not difficult and it, it requires some reading but it's really not difficult to research like the culture really wasn't the only reason why the culture became so different was because of the islamic conquests because the empire from my understanding transitioned to a universal empire of all christians essentially but still essentially a kind of nation state into something akin to um a in an exclusive um but inclusive to the people who lived in it uh, identity of, of an ethno state basically similar to how it might be the new jerusalem or the new israel or chosen people that kind of thing and it's a, you actually see that in the early modern period with things like the beginning of national nationalism in um, the early modern period in western europe you get this kind of um this allegory that that kind of england is the new jerusalem and um, the people living are the new Israel or the new Jews. They are the new chosen people. Um, it's interesting to see. It's interesting to see where these themes coalesce together. Speaking of culture, many historically interested players of Crusader Kings 3 are unhappy about the cultural representation of the Byzantine Empire in game. The Byzantine Empire in the 11th century was home to a large variety of peoples, including Khazars, Bulgars, 
Turks, Armenians, Slavs, Goths, Arabs, Illyrians, Thracians, Assyrians, and many other groups. Whilst the majority language was Greek in many parts of the 1066 Byzantine Empire, the Greek culture in the game is overrepresented, clearly exceeding the historical Greek-speaking lands by also including Crimea, Inner Anatolia, and even significant parts of southern Italy. Right, this is wrong. This is just plainly wrong, and I'm going to show you why it's wrong. Based on the historical context, this is actually quite correct. Um, and, uh, you know, Paradox has actually done quite good work on this. I can actually give you an ethno ethnographic analysis. The whole of Anatolia at this time would have been full of Romans, Greek-speaking Romans or Aramaic-speaking Romans. Uh, Greece at this time, in this certainly in this part, would have been full of Romans. Uh, the Peloponnese at this point had a Slavic migration that occupied a large portion of the land, but um, they the chieftains ruled as um, in like independent-ish vassals to the state. They were given the title of Archeon. Um, but eventually, the Slavs living in Greece were homogenized and assimilated into Roman culture. Um, the places that are described as Greek here, or more accurately, should be Roman, uh, would have considered themselves uh, Romans. Um, but you also had Lombards and like Latin speaking Italians, essentially. Um, this whole swathe of Bulgarian is actually quite accurate. Um, it, because the, this is essentially what would be considered occupied land, though the Ro and it very much is because uh, for for Bulgars living, you could rise through the army, but unless you assimilated into the Roman culture, you would not go into high positions of power. Now there are situations where that is definitely not the case because, um. For example, the uh, church tends to complain that Armenians and are in very high positions of power, uh, despite the fact they're actually um, her heretics in the eyes of the church. Um, but it, it really seems like the Romans overall didn't really care as much, depending on where you are and kind of what the situation is. The northern part of Crimea would have been inhabited by Romans and would have had a Roman city. So, yes, they are Romans. Uh, the Armenians would have um, migrated uh, to Cilicia at this point because um, of the opportunities that provided it. And by the time Manzika happens, um, they were somewhat being assimilated into Roman culture and that all kind of falls apart, which is why you get this independent Armenian state of Cilicia at the time. So this is actually quite accurate. I don't think the person who did this research understands how um, the ethnic composition of lands can change through time. So let's see, this, um, this composition here, what we see um, certainly when it cooks, oh, and uh, Cyprus also would have been inherited by an Arab population as well, but the majority would have been Eastern Roman. Um, so this modern and historical distribution of Greeks isn't actually accurate. Um, before pre manzika the the entire land of Anatolia um, would have been inhabited by Eastern Romans who spoke Romaic. Um, certainly, that was would be the case. This kind of distribution is more post manzika and probably within the Ottoman Empire, though the 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 main distribution would have been uh, Pontic Greek. So this section here, and also Cappadocian Greek, which is this section here. You also had a large centre in Constantinople or modern-day Istanbul, and also on the coast of um, Western Anatolia, and it all became depopulated after the population exchange in 1923. But what this person is saying isn't particularly accurate. Uh, I don't think it's accurate at all. I think this person's done limited reading and doesn't really know what they're talking about. Cultural diversity in Anatolia and the Balkans. So when we talk about cultural diversity in uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, it's important to understand that uh, even in terms of proportions, and we can apply this to the army as well, um, when, when we do, often when uh, ethnic compositions of the Roman army that isn't Roman is being described, 
the largest one was the Varangian Guard, which was at that point in time an institution. But the other people who are part of it, a, a couple of thousand here, a hundred here, certainly not the majority. And the, the same goes for this Eastern Roman polity. Um, th there isn't really enough of a majority in a lot of places to make it a truly diverse place. Um, in, in Constantinople, you have different districts for certain ethnicities. So it's not this free-flowing place that is very diverse. You have uh, districts for Jews, for example, and you might have had districts for Muslims as well. Um, though probably the Muslims which are going to be in Constantinople are hostages. Uh, but they're well treated and they're given their own places of worship. Um, and the same you could say maybe for Slavs as well. So this kind of thing that the, the Eastern Roman polity state or whatever is, was this truly diverse place full of different ethnicities is certainly not the case. It becomes more apparent as uh, the Eastern this Eastern state begins to expand into the Bulgar state, into uh, these formerly kind of Muslim lands. So for example, here with... Um, Antioch in this Armenian place which basically gets annexed because a lot of the kings kind of um, give up their land for titles and a salary from the state basically um, so there's this th this kind of idea that this the Eastern Roman Empire was this kind of diverse state with this ambiguous uniform Byzantine term where um anybody who was a christian could be a, a byzantine is absolutely wrong it's based on a lot of um, bad historiography and somewhat orientalist as well and it's just used to delegitimize the romanness of the eastern roman empire um but even that case like it, by all accounts the eastern roman state was more similar to a nation state um so more similar to say the uk in uh, the 1950s where you had or the 1960s where you had immigrants coming in who were different ethnicities but you know they they were very small in comparison to the majority of the population it's a very modern phenomena where we have uh, modern western countries being more uh, racially or ethnically diverse it certainly wasn't the case 40 years ago by making largish parts of the empire bulgarian and armenian but it is just not true that these other areas were majority Greek-speaking. Yes, actually, it is the case. Um, the homogeny of this kind of Armenian section and the homogeny of this Bulgarian section uh, would have been very much true to the place. Um, there were some uh, Slavic uh, peoples who became integrated into the Roman culture, and by the time... Oh dear, what's going on? So by the time we get to the point of Basil II, uh, it, this kind of perception that uh, um, this this Slavic population is um, is really just Roman at this point. They've been fully assimilated into the Roman state and they are kind of regarded. And it's actually quite interesting because there's a community in greece which are referred to as hellenes but they're referred to as hellenes because they are pagan which is kind of the main definition at this point if you're called a hellene or um it usually is used as a term by the eastern romans to depict um non-roman um sorry uh, to depict people who worship uh pagan gods or polytheist gods um regardless of their, whether they're Greek speaking or not. And it's actually funny because you get terms like the Sassanids being called Hellenes as well. And so the definition of Hellene actually changes as well. Um, in this place in uh, around Antioch, you would probably have more uh, Arabic Christians, though they're also Greek Orthodox. Um, and then in the northern part of Greece, or certainly within Greece, there would have been a mixture of Arab and Greek speakers, though uh, within Cyprus, uh, probably Eastern Romans formed the majority. On a slightly unrelated note for this video, I just had to check out that last Byzantine remnant in southern Italy that the game shows.
Here you have an autonomous Greek count ruling an allegedly Greek population in 1066, Naples. While the representation of Naples as a culturally Greek county in 1066 is almost absurd, we took a closer look at its ruler, Count Sergius V of Napoli, who was actually a Duke of Naples from the Sergian dynasty which ruled as Dukes of Naples from 840 to 1139. The founder of this dynasty, Sergius I, who ruled the duchy from 840 to 864, was the son of a Byzantine patrician that was called Marino il Greco. So actually, it's it's quite interesting when we have a look at this because um, the the way that the Italian lands were ruled by the Eastern Romans was different to what it would have been ruled in in the mainland. So you get this perception anyway that the Italian parts are kind of the periphery of the state and the core of the state is kind of where Anatolia and Greece is. Um, so, you know, in, in these situations... Um, Eastern Romans would politically let the Lombards sort out affairs and also Italians, Latin speakers, sort out their affairs based on their own laws and customs. Um, and this is kind of to accommodate people, but also um, the, the situation in this part of the world, I guess, or this part of Europe is completely different to what it would be uh, on the mainland, which is a lot more homogenized ethnically, and is something that is just a lot more um, standardized in terms of identity. So, Marino the Greek, by the local population. So although the concepts of ethnicity and hereditary culture were at least as fluent in the 11th century as they are today, it is arguably not wrong of the paradox to portray this ruler as Greek. It is just a pity that they failed the much more historically unambiguous decision to make the famous medieval duchy of Napoli actually a duchy okay i can't really comment much on that um it, it, a duke in um the the eastern roman context is different to what a duke would be in a feudal context or a western latin context so the top dog of the byzantine empire in 1066 as mentioned earlier is basilius constantinos the 10th of the ducas dynasty he is 60 years old in the game, which should be correct historically, since Byzantine scholars have noted that he died a year later, in 1067, at slightly over 60 years old. Looking at the Ducas dynasty tree, we can see that Constantinos is the first in the family to become Byzantine emperor, which is historically accurate, as from his family, only himself, his son Michael, and grandson Constantine ruled the Byzantine empire. So again, with the with the Byzantine Empire or this Eastern Roman state, um, the reason why there aren't a lot of people within his family who would have ruled is because the precipice of who decides to be Roman Empire emperor is not bound by lineage, and it's not um, there's there's not a genealogy aspect. Anybody is capable of becoming Roman emperor if they are popular enough or seen as competent enough, or if they have, like, the backing of the army. And then, like, for example, cities could choose whether or not to open or close their gates to whenever there is a succession crisis. Constantinus's ancestors are not mentioned in any primary sources, but some historians have argued that he must have been the son of Andronikos Dukas, a nobleman who served as an important general during the reign of Basil II from 976 to 1025. In his younger years, Constantinos was described as a keen academic. Okay, I'm just gonna forward it. Okay. ...popular with the Byzantine state bureaucracy. And during his reign, he continued to appeal to the bureaucracy with his policies, which allowed him to reign in quite a stable way, despite being unpopular with the general population. So it's, it's a matter of ba balancing different things. Um, because you can be popular with the army, but if you're not popular with the population or the church, it can actually be quite detrimental to you. And despite being popular with the bureaucracy, that doesn't necessarily make him a competent ruler. What emperors were doing at this time was when they would get power, they would like basically give out money uh, to people to secure political favors. And it eventually grew out of hand where... Um, the empire itself became cash-strapped. 
Um, and at the time of Manzika, like you could say that the empire was bordering bankruptcy. So, you know, having the support of the army isn't necessarily, or the bureaucracy more accurately, isn't necessarily uh, a decent thing because you have to, you could, it could result in this blowing up of this uh, bureaucrat state. You have a lot of people who have titles who really shouldn't have titles and you have these large amount of kind of useless retainers who do these bureaucratic rituals that don't mean anything. These taxes he had raised. The military didn't like him either and there was an assassination attempt organised by some of his generals in 1061. Perhaps one of the motivations of the military to try to assassinate him was that by the end of Constantinos' reign, the Byzantine Empire had shrunk. He lost their last remaining strongholds in southern Italy to the Normans, the Armenian heartland and eastern Anatolia to the Seljuk Turks, and significant parts of the Balkans including modern day Belgrade to the Hungarians. So it seems like whilst Constantinos was skillfully playing the game of internal politics by getting the powerful bureaucracy on his side, his foreign policy lacked vision. So with this kind of uh, perception of losing lands, um, they're not uh, at this point in time, the Seljuks are kind of beginning to cause trouble for the Eastern Romans, but we don't really see Manzika. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean they perceived what would happen eventually with Manzika. And the same with the losing of Sicily. There wasn't this perception that uh, they had lost it permanently. It could always be uh, conquered back or brought back into the fold. Um, so this would have been seen as kind of unpopular with the army and also with people as well. But in, a, in another way, people would have just thrown up their hands of... You know, if you're a ruler, what can you really do about these situations? Um, but again, it's it's an economic issue as well. At this point in time, the the Eastern Roman state was becoming incredibly strapped for cash. Um, it probably wasn't as drastic as people portray it, but at the same time, like we we see that uh, Roman kings or emperors are having issues with uh, trying to raise adequate amount of money, and it's actually this weakness in leadership which kind of starts this snowball effect that eventually leads to the civil war of the Manzika. Strength. The biggest issue with Crusader Kings' depiction of the Byzantine Empire is probably the way how Western European feudalism is used as the template of representing their system of governance. When in so in Crusader Kings 2, they actually do a very good job um, whereby um, vassals are interpreted as not being bound by life uh, appointments, but are seen as uh, bureaucrats, which though have lifetime appointments can be uh, dismissed as well as appointed. And um, yeah, there, there are some pitfalls in Crusader Kings 2. For example, if you're really weak, um vassals can all who are cons who are really the bureaucrats can start waging war um but then again you know that is something that happened under zimiskis and stuff so it's not necessarily that bad it's really how you get this game mechanic to work within the system of the game and make an exception in that case uh from my perception i didn't really think this was much of a big deal in reality things worked very differently there as mentioned before the Byzantines did not place their existence in the feudal tradition of Western Europe. So this is probably something that was put as a um, as a generalizing thing, and then what Paradox initially eventually does is uh, implements DLC to make up the difference. Um, so really, when you see any inconsistencies in a Paradox game, it's likely maybe there's going to be a DLC um, that rectifies it in some way. And this is something that probably happened in Crusader Kings 2 as well, because that difference between imperial rule and feudal rule is uh, quite evident. But rather saw themselves as a mere continuation of the ancient Roman Empire. Thus, it is inaccurate to say that under the Basilius, there was a feudal system of dukes and counts. We tried to figure out how Paradox came up with the duchies that are present in the game, and quickly found the source of confusion. In the High Medieval Byzantine Empire, the Byzantines had changed their governmental system from the ancient Roman provinces to several smaller districts called Themes. Okay, so 
themes are a bit complicated because before um Nicky Ferros the first they're not called themes uh they're simply references to the um the field armies which settled in Anatolia after the Islamic conquests of what was then territory owned by the Sassanids and the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. Um, but things like the Armeniacon, the Anatolicon, these are all names of field armies. And they were ruled by Astradigos, who's a general, but also has a civilian authority as well. So they're sort of these military districts. Uh, the theme comes mainly by Nikiferos I, in which case... He brings in legislation to say that rather than the state subsidizing soldiers, each theme would subsidize their own uh, army within their district. And there's some there's some debate as to what um, thematic armies are. Um, some consider them to be uh, well trained soldiers. Other than, others consider them to be uh, farmers called up in times of conflict. Um, they seem, from my understanding anyway, they seem to be depicted as a lot more fickle compared to the Tag Martyrs, who are the permanent uh, regiment stationed in Constantinople. Or Fermata in Greek. These themes were administrative divisions ruled by military leadership sent by the Byzantine Emperor. Again, this the, the term theme isn't really recognisable from my understanding until Nikiferos I. Beforehand, they're just references to the field armies that used to exist, but settled in um, the Anatolia. They were established in the mid-7th century in the aftermath of the Slavic invasion of the Balkans and Muslim conquests of eastern Anatolia, and were intended to better defend the empire. Their strong military and administrative character was also evident in the story of their creation. The first themes were created from the areas of encampment of the field armies of the East Roman army. There you go. And their names correspond to the military units that had existed in those areas. You can see on this map of the Anatolian themes from the 10th century that they match the alleged Byzantine duchies in the game. It would be greatly appreciated if someone in the comments can correct my pronunciation coming up. So here we go. We've got Optimakoi. Optimadi. Opsikion. Opsikion. And Bulsalarians Bukelarian. in the northwest of Anatolia, south of them, Thracians, uh, Thra Thragesian, Anatolic, Anatolicon, and Sibereots. Uh, God, how am I going to do this? Kipirichaiodis uh, or Kipirichaiodis. Uh, Okay, I've got to do this properly. Kibiri Chaeodis. In the middle, we have Cappadocia. Cappadocia. Cassianon. Cassianon. Uh, and Armeniac. Armeniacon. And in the east, you have Sebastia. Sebastia. Chaldea. Uh, Chaldea. Or Chaldea. And Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. I think I got the last one, maybe. Unfortunately, Paradox was clearly grasping at historical straws here and completely misappropriated facts to fit their Eastern Roman duchy system. It's not really a question of uh, misappropriating facts to, to fit their Eastern Roman system. It's a matter of logistics with the video game company. Sim put simply, they've got to create a giant game and they don't have the resources um to implement all this unique stuff which is a lot a reason why a lot of uh the video game developers now turn to dlcs because it's a way to generate longevity for the game whether or not you ethically agree with that is completely irrelevant uh it, it's just a representation on what economics is in terms of what um video game development so likely they had this idea in the works, but due to video game development and the way it works and it's a big money sink and well, you know, just because you release a triple A game that makes 10 million doesn't necessarily mean that your company's going to exist in 10 years time. Um, games are very expensive to make and they're very expensive endeavors. So likely what's happened is 
Um, and based on what I've seen with Crusader Kings 2, the video game company Paradox had this idea in mind. They didn't have the money to do it. So they told themselves they were going to do an expansion to make this work. And, you know, it might take a few years, but that's what you get. So likely when they what they had this, they had a planning point or a whiteboard where they wrote this all down. And if this inappropriate geographic representation was not enough, the Empire itself starts as a realm with the lowest possible crown authority, with the law autonomous vassals. So the vassals that did not even exist in this way can basically do whatever they want within the Empire. Just imagine that, commanders of legions in the Roman Empire, or its Byzantine successor, legally fighting each other for land. So they can't fight each other for land, but in terms of um, authority, you know, John Zimiskis went on a lot of campaigns when he was a general. Um, and, you know, that could be seen as a threat by Byzantine emperors. But uh, Stradigos of Themes were very much given leeway on how they uh, ruled the lands that they were administered, that they were given administration of. And um, you see this because uh, one thorn always in the ruling party side is this thing that if we have these people become very important, they're going to be a threat and then their soldiers are going to uh, appoint them as emperor and now you have a civil war and now you have pretenders to the throne. So this idea that these uh, vassals were autonomous isn't necessarily as far-fetched as um, the person doing this video is uh, making you believe. Um, because, uh, you know, theoretically, the, the Eastern Roman king or Roman emperor has unlimited power. But in reality, he's bound by the polity and limitations of the state, which is the polity of the Romans. If the Romans don't consent to his rule, um, he'll be replaced by somebody else. It can be a very cutthroat, but at the same time, it's a really weird democratic system where voting doesn't exist. But even the terminology when we choose emperors or when emperors are chosen is elected. So you still have that kind of Republican terminology being used here. While the emperor is powerless to intervene. Well, if, if the emperor is in Constantinople and the Stradigos is very powerful and he has like 10,000 men, um, there isn't really much the, the Byzantine emperor can do in that case. Uh, and it, it can actually be detrimental to him if he decides to remove that person because um, his men might see it as unjust, he, uh, the person himself might see it as unjust, and now you have a bunch of soldiers proclaiming this person as an emperor, and now you have a succession crisis. So it's actually not as absurd as it's made out to be. This is not to say that there was no similar system to feudalism in the Byzantine Empire. One of the biggest weaknesses of the early Eastern Roman Empire was its high degree of centralization, so the emperors were smart to grant swathes of income and important titles to powerful patrician families or religious institutions in the empire, in a system called Pronoia. No. Just no. Let's actually listen to what he's going to say. However... Right, no. Just no. Pronoia comes at the time of Alexius Komnenos. It is used... It is kind of different to what was happening before. And it's basically, you give land and retinue to uh, a particular person who's appointed by the state. It's a shareholding scheme, so it can be taken away from them. But essentially, um, they raise retinues. And I believe the, um, the compromise is that they don't really pay taxes or they pay significantly lower taxes. But the, 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 and it's similar to the Itka system in the Islamic world, which is the shareholding system whereby um, you don't have vassals who are bound to the land and their descendants go, they're appointed to that land, which is actually a detriment because they're going to want to get the maximum amount of benefit out of their short time tending to the land, so they tend to abuse the system. Um, and it's kind of similar. Um, so Alexius Komnenos might have been uh, inspired by either uh, the feudal system or maybe the Itka system. Um, or maybe it had just been a compromise at the time 
uh, to make the deteriorating Roman system work. But this kind of idea that the Pronoia had existed beforehand is completely absurd. These grants were not transferable or hereditary. So speaking in the legal terminology of the Byzantine Empire, Pronoia gave the grantee possession, not ownership, which remained strictly imperial. See, it's a shareholding system. Uh, essentially. So if you compared the Byzantine Empire with the other famous European medieval empire, the Holy Roman Empire, the former clearly gave its ruler a much more centralised position of power than the latter. I mean, the idea of centralisation varies and it depends on what you mean by that definition. Are they centralised in which they have a very standardised bureaucracy and uh, that the the lands are privy to the Roman state and its authority of a standardized legal structure, yes. Within that system, if there are powerful stradighi, or individually a stradigos, um, who, who has the authority to defy the Byzantine emperor or king, it's not a question of centralized power anymore because there is no monopoly over authority or power in that state. So even within a centralized system, that can vary entirely. And uh, the, the, East, the Roman kings or emperors who ruled were very much aware of that. Meaning the initial crown authority of the Byzantine Empire in CK3 should definitely be higher. Um, it depends what you mean by authority. Um, if, if the, uh, it, it's different from the West because the sense of legitimacy is different. If nobody consents to, it's almost like rule of consent, but there's no voting framework to sustain it or legalistic framework to sustain it. It was very much uh, implicitly applied rather than explicitly applied or expected. Um, because there was no um, succession requirement that was legally bound in law. Um, so it'd either be a descendant or it'd be somebody appointed. But if there's a pretender and people support them, um, there's no legal uh, mechanisms to go through. So anybody can be capable of being a Byzantine emperor in this case. Um, and that, that can be very detrimental for the state in its entirety. Um, and it's no coincidence, as said previously, that the Eastern Roman state is renowned for the amount of civil wars and usurpations that exist. Being an Eastern Roman emperor is incredibly difficult, and it was probably one of the most difficult positions in the medieval period, right next to the Mamluk sultans. While the duchy titles Paradox created were evidently flawed, they did try to make the most important vassals of Basilius Constantinos X important figures that actually existed. For instance, we have the Ecumenical Patriarch. Okay, so um, this is going into specifics. I don't think it's really relevant uh, to this conversation now um, any further points because it's just going to get into very historical nitty-gritty details however I think uh, this discourse that has been said is actually quite valid and it's um, I think the person who has done this video has done some brief reading but I don't think they understand what they're talking about um, they don't, sorry, more correct, let me be more precise. They don't understand what they're talking about. And um, I, when I started seeing this, like, I could just feel kind of the frustration building up um, when I was watching this, when it comes to, when it came to the, uh, talking about this Eastern Roman state. Um, so this is what I wanted to show people. And I hope this has been uh, somewhat, uh, educational and kind of brings a lot of clarity that a lot of these popular myths surrounding the Byzantine Empire aren't necessarily true and a, there's a lot of implied assumptions in this video that simply don't hold true to historical evidence and anybody who you know is a main historic historian of the Eastern Roman Empire or who reads the primary sources would be able to um, would be able to prove that this is the case but anyway i hope you've enjoyed this video let's go to a more uh positive title of all right that's good enough um i hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you very much